What's up, everybody? It's John Morgan. Listen, I want to come to y'all and tell y'all right now where you can go and get your LYP merch, www.lypp.org. That's where you can get all the fly crew necks like the one I got on right now. You're going to get your hoodies, your hats, any type of product that we sell in that LYP, you have to go to the website to get it. You can't go to Amazon or no, no third-party company to get our products. You got to go to www.lypp.org right now to get all of this latest stuff lyp you can also get information on the pod new information on the episodes that we got dropping anything lyp related go to that website right now lypp.org peace It's pod day. It's Tuesday. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Leah Purpose Podcast. Listen, it feels so good to be um, in our new space. Um, as y'all can see, it's a little different eyes, a little different setup on us today. Um, and it feels good to just be here, the first first recording in here um, during during this episode. Um, but I'm super excited for this episode for a couple of different reasons. Number one, like I said, it's the first one in our in our new space. But number two is because I normally, not, I guess not really out of too much intention, but I normally don't always have a lot of repeat guests like that. Um, I've only had maybe three people come on twice, but the first person who ever came on twice is actually going to be the first person who come, came on for a third time. And, you know, hopefully we can keep her as a, like a reoccurring guest spot. You know what I'm saying? And I'm glad I put that on camera. We got it recorded now, so maybe we'll put some... A little pressure on it to, to do it. Um, we got Dr. T, y'all. Dr. Tania Lodge. Um, if y'all if y'all been following LYP, man, we we touched base on Dr. T's um, story. I think on episode seven, if I'm not mistaken. And Dr. T also came back and talked to us a little bit um, during the pandemic. So Dr. T has been with us on a couple of different um, segments on LYP, and now she is here with us to you know kind of update us a little bit and just and, and really. I got a lot of good questions for us on the um on the on the couples and relationship side of things. So before we even get into that, Dr. T, how are you? How you feel? Hey, yeah, I feel great and super excited to be back a third time. Yeah. So this is good. Thank you so much for the invite. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. So speed 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 me up a little bit. Like catch catch me at the speed. Um how What's what's been going on with you? How's your how's your energy? Like how's your spirit right now in this in this season of life? Like how how are you? How are you feeling? We almost wrapping up twenty twenty two. Last time I seen you on this side, uh-huh. we was recording virtually. So like, oh, catch right. us up. Like how how are you? What's been going on? How's your energy again during right. during this season? My energy is better. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of life changing. Um, things happening and a lot of professional movement. And so I'm just really just settling in to live in my purpose. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, and all of that was revisited or at least reevaluated based on some life changes that took place over the course of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I'm settling in. I'm excited. Um, I feel focused and grounded and doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So that feels amazing. That's beautiful. How much of the um how much of the pandemic you had you think had to do with that to where you are now? I think the pandemic probably 90% of what has happened um is a result of how things were moving during the pandemic. Absolutely. Mm. In what way? So just to go back a little bit into my history, um, when I first started out in the field, I studied marriage and family therapy. Mm-hmm. And I got my first master's degree in marriage and family therapy, got licensed and was doing some, um, I was practicing. But that shifted given the um, different organizations and agencies that I was working for. Um, so it kind of pulled me away from couples and family. Mm-hmm. Um, during the pandemic and working from home, um, it, it shed light on a couple different things. But what happened is I ended up um, 
going back to the Cleveland VA, which is where I did my clinical training when I was um, pursuing my doctorate degree. And the position that I took was for couples and families. So primarily, um, currently, I am a psychologist at the Cleveland VA, and I'm the family service coordinator. So essentially, um, I coordinate um, care for couples and families. Okay. So that is very interesting because it took me back to my roots, right. if you will, to the in origin. terms of why I went into the field mm -hmm. and my you know, goal and passion during that time. Because I started off working for... Um, Children uh, Protective Services, so working a lot with families, okay. understanding how that influences a lot of what's happening with us individually. So I got reconnected, um, and my work with couples has been rewarding, it's been eye-opening, hmm. it's been very revealing, um, and so working with um, the couples and individual veterans, um, one veteran actually... Uh, made a comment to me, <clears throat> which I thought was absolutely um, phenomenal. And what she talked to me about was um, my gifts. And so she asked me specifically about if she could talk to me about the messages she's been receiving from the ancestors. <laughs> so, about you. About me. Okay. <laughs> and I said, and I met with this veteran um, maybe two times. So the third time she said, I have a message for you. Is it okay if I share? Someone who is very grounded um, and believe in the universe and the ancestors and I'm very spiritually connected. I'm like, absolutely. You got a message for me? Yeah, tell, tell me. me. <laughs> what the ancestors want me to know. And she said, the ancestors want you to know that you work for systems that are oppressive and they don't really honor the true nature of your gifts. Mm. You have gifts and a purpose outside of these systems. And so the ancestors want you to explore that. Mm. It was so groundbreaking and eye opening for me that I did. I went um, and I explored that and I listened. And so I ended up launching my um, private practice Kindred Spirit Behavioral Health, where I am focused more so on couples and families. Okay, let's shout out to that. Shout out to that. <laughs> hit, my, hit my little applause button. Shout out to Dr. T. Yes, yes, we love that. We love people investing in themselves. Continue, please. Absolutely. Um, so I started to shift. One of the things I think is important is there's a lot of... Um, providers who are working with individuals. Um, there are a lot of mental health agencies that work with individuals um, and they work with families. But in my current role, when we are not able to meet the need of, of people who are coming through the system, we have to refer them out to the community. Right. And so I became aware that there is a shortage of therapists who specialize in or who are competent to do couples and family work. Yeah. Um, so I was like, oh no. So that allowed me to just refocus, reshift and launch, you know, again, what I intended to go into the um, field with back in early 2000. So that's, ha that's been, that's been good. And when I'm working with these couples um, and family, that, that, that feeling um, that I get is kindred, which is how, you know, the name kind of... Got it. Okay. How the name right. That's how it aligns. Okay. Um, and I actually had one person say, you know, we're, we're kindred spirits. And I'm like, well, say more about that because I understand what that means, but I wanted to hear from his perspective what he meant. And he said, well, anytime we can sit down and I can feel safe enough and comfortable enough to say the things and talk about the things that I can in other environments or with other people. You are a kindred spirit. Yeah. I said, Ashe. <laughs> so, Facts. And so it is. And so, um, yeah, I think spending more time with focusing more on the relationship aspects um, is where we need to go. So even when we think about what happened in the pandemic, the pandemic shed a lot of light on how damaged our relationships are. Yeah. Not just, you know, our view of self and our view of community, but how we relate to other people and the kind of relationships we find ourselves in, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. There's a lot to unpack there. And I think 
focusing more on that aspect will allow individuals to do more healing on an individual um, basis. There's this myth that, well, you know, we have to focus on self, we have to focus on self. When you think about that, and although that's important, it's also very individualistic, Mm -hmm. which is um, not consistent with who we are as African people. Mm -hmm. So we have to do both and. We have to be able to focus on our connections with others, those relationships, and self at the same time Mm -hmm. in order to promote healing and our potential for growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, you said a whole bunch that I I want to I want to touch on. But you so the first thing that comes to my mind is what you said about like um providers being limited to provide like adequate adequate care Mm -hmm. for for couples. I know that to be true firsthand. Um before Sierra and I seen the person, the provider that we see regularly now, Mm -hmm. we went to another provider and we seen her maybe four or five sessions, maybe like that, I want I want to say. Neither one of us really, really cared for her like that, but C really def- definitely didn't. Okay. Um she was she was a little bit more on it on, on it than me. She was like, no, nah, I'm not I'm not vibe. But overall though, she just didn't have really what we needed mm-hmm. um to kind of lead us on what where we was looking to go. Um I I didn't I didn't mention it, but Dr. T is a licensed psychologist. Um and a lot of the work that you have done, I've grown to really appreciate, right? You know what I'm saying? Really understanding um, healing and growing to under, understand healing. But, okay, so going back to the pandemic, what do you think that you learned about yourself that helped you along to, like, understanding that, okay, now it's time for me to kind of, like, shift into doing some things more business-related. Was It also shifted in, you know... Um, just kind of like, you know, investing in yourself in, in that way. And, you know, understanding that you wanted to kind of go back and do things connected to your origin and working with families and couples. Like, what did you learn about you during that time that you think helped you? Yeah, <clears throat> I learned that I was not living um, up to my true purpose. Mm. You know, we get bogged down in the day-to-day and the hustle and bustle of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we find ourselves involved in either projects or working for facilities. Um, And again, you just were inundated in that. And it's just constant stress, working hundreds of hours and don't really feel like you're making a real difference. Because again, you're also limited by these different systems that are in place. Um, So I think I learned about myself is... um, I need to do more that's going to be purposeful and rewarding. Mm. I have done a lot of work based on what people expect of me, Mm. um, what people want from me, which was another message (laughs) that I received from the ancestors is people have what you need. You have the gifts, you have um, the credentials, the certification to do what you need to do for our people and not be bogged down by oppressive systems or rules and regulations that doesn't really serve our people, people of African descent well. Um, So that really resonated with me. And, you know, it's not that I am going off on my own, but I want to develop a community of people and of professionals where we can collaborate and do this work together. So just reevaluating like what are my values and am I really living up to my real purpose and what I say I believe in um and that was a hard thing it was a it was a hard thing and it was um it was life changing and all of it is purposeful because while that was happening um John, the universe is always in order. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, divine was, order, that's a fact. Divine order. Why all of this was happening usually People have these revelations or changes um, when something life-threatening happens. <laughs> so I had a very life-threatening situation happen just in the, during the pandemic, and this was just in the midst of me um, moving into the VA space, going to work for couples. So, and during that process, um, I got diagnosed with early-stage breast cancer. Um, and again, I'm like, wait, what? 
there's no family history. There's no risk factors. When I go down the checklist, it's, everything is no, 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 no. So how could this have happened? Um, and the, how do I make sense of that is because it was my time to sit down, <laughs> reevaluate, receive the messages from the ancestors, listen, and move forward. And that's what I'm doing. Mm, mm. That's so that's so good. Yeah. <laughs> that 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 is so good. Number one, why do, why do you think so many of us do that? Why do so many of us have an easier maybe I won't even say easier, but how why do so many of us choose to do things for others before we do things for ourselves? Why do why is that come a little bit more natural for us, you know, or just a little bit more receptive to that? as opposed to actually sitting down and doing that work and spending that time with ourselves. Why is that Why is that the harder thing for us to do? It's because of how we're socialized. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in more um, Eurocentric culture, if you will, it's really individualized. So every emphasis is just on the self and the person there's no real connection to family, to community, or to your higher power, your spiritual self. There's a disconnect there. So even when we try to tap into that or understand that, the pendulum swings all the way over to this side. And so we focus more on family and community, and we, we neglect the self. Mm -hmm. So we have to come to the middle and find some balance, because knowing who we are and focusing on self allows us to pour into family and into our community. And so it's the symbiotic process that happens simultaneously. But we're, we function in a world that's either or. So <laughs> either we're going to fun, which is, again, very Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. We're going to focus on self, where we neglect um, family, um, community, our spiritual selves, et cetera, or we focus on um, every family community and we neglect self and now we don't have much to pour into so we need a balance and a combination of both in order for us to be able to reach our full potential when that life-threatening situation did come when you were diagnosed with cancer um and it was during it was during the pandemic it was during the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> yeah so how how was that talk to me about like them early them early moments of getting diagnosed in the pandemic we in this crazy time you isolated Talk to me a little bit about like, you know, what that was like. All of that. So, and you know, so I I was okay with being isolated because I tend to be very private. Okay. <clears throat> and because of the work that I do and everything that I was responsible for, I didn't want people to worry. Yeah. Um, and I was trying not to worry. Right. So the isolation and privacy to a degree initially was helpful. In mm -hmm. retrospect, I can see how um, it was in powerful in a different way. Um, so I think that part of it was fine. I think the interesting thing though, John is, um, after I got over the initial shock and like, are you sure? Like, this is crazy. Like, how does this happen? I did everything. I breastfed both of my children. I had both of my children within the time frame that reduces your risk, mm -hmm. right? I don't smoke or drink. There's no family history. Like I'm not on birth control, like how could this have happened? And so once I, you know, got through that phase of it, because there's no real answer, yeah. like there's no exact science right. to say this is how it happens. Right. Uh, oh, and I'm not obese, so that was the other thing. Mm -hmm. Obesity um, kind of contributes to it. So um, once I got through that phase, um, I, I dived into the research because there were so many opinions about... Um, the treatment regimen or okay. what should you do or mm -hmm. what shouldn't you do. It's early stage. Just have it removed. There's no signs of cancer in your body. So why do you need chemotherapy and or radiation? So I, I toy with that. And of course, you know, when you think about that, for me, it was scary because I had a son in high school who was playing <laughs> high school football as we're going into football season. I also have a daughter who's very active. Um, and ch with cheer and tumbling. So I, I move around a lot. Right, you're moving. I don't want to be sick. 
I don't want to be compromised. I want to be able to be present. I don't want them to worry. So I had all of that that I was trying to reconcile and work through. Right. Um, so, you know, when they say, well, yeah, this is preventative. The doctors were saying that it was caught early. There's no signs. Um, but to prevent it from coming back because of my age now puts me in a high-risk category that you probably should do um, chemotherapy and we should do some radiation. And I'm thinking to myself, like, uh, that sounds pretty aggressive mm-hmm. for something that's po- supposed to be prevention. Right. So, so I got that feedback and I had a horrible experience um, at the one facility where I was getting my care. So I went and got a second opinion. And when I got a second opinion, in, in the midst of me waiting for my second opinion, I'm doing my own research. Um, I'm talking to other black women with similar experiences um, or who know somebody who had a similar experience. So I'm gathering all of this information and I'm critically evaluating all of this information so I can make an informed decision about what I want to do. What you need to do. Mm-hmm. Because I'm a mother, yeah. right? And I'm all of these things to all of these people. So it's important for me to make a good decision where I can maximize my health, right. where I can be present for my people. Right. Um, so I did elect to go through with the um, aggressive um, treatment approach to eliminate or any risk of this recurring or spreading to other areas of my body. And the reason that that's important is because <clears throat> in my research and talking to other women and just reflecting on, you know, outcomes that black women have in general, you know, we have a lot of cultural mistrust of the health system in general. Yeah. And so we're not always open to treatment recommendations or feedback because we don't trust the system, given mm-hmm. the history and even the current experiences that we've had in this country related to health care. Right. Um, so I eat a vaccine and every, everything all else. All of right. that. Mm-hmm. You got mm-hmm. physicians dying right. from COVID. Right. <laughs> like, all, right. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm holding all of this and mm-hmm. processing it and making sense of it. Um, and what I found is I'm like, well, you know, we as, as black women in particular who deal with breast cancer, we have poor outcomes because we're not trusting the system. Um, whether we're not getting regular routine mammograms, whether we're not open to what they're saying, the treatment, the best treatment approach to deal with your circumstances. When we're not open to that and we want to deal with, you know, our, do it our way or, you know, take the feedback of other less experienced people then that contributes, unfortunately, to our outcomes. Right. Um, so is it a reason and is it valid and reasonable to have mistrust? Absolutely. But does that mean you do the opposite? No. It means you dive into the research. Mm-hmm. You critically evaluate any and everything. You talk to other people. You critically evaluate everything. You don't make decisions based off of how other people make That's decisions. Right. That's right. You don't do what the doctors tell you to do because it is evidence-based or best practice. Right. But you take all of that information, you take it all, and you critically evaluate, and you'll know the right decision that you need to make for you moving forward. And so that's just, you know, that in and of itself was very eye-opening because, again, to deal with it in real time and experience the horrible (laughs) way that black women are treated in healthcare. Like all of this was, was happening and I'm trying to manage all of it, understanding what I do for a living, understanding what black women go through, black women outcomes, my own family and my children, like all of that. It was a lot. Do you sometimes Hate the fact that you're a psychologist. Oh and, my gosh, and, it's a and, blessing and, and a curse. Because you're always thinking and always considering this and always thinking about this and all of that, all of that. So it has been super helpful and rewarding, but it's also the source of my anxiety. <laughs> right, <laughs> so it's both of those things. Right, because yes. you 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 got high consciousness, so it's yeah, it comes That's with right. the, it comes with the it comes it comes with the territory. Yeah. So how do you how do you reckon with you know the divinity and what you've been through today. You talked about it being divine. You went through it for a reason. Like, why and how has it been divine for you? Was it the 
the constant movement? Was it the stress? You know what I'm saying? You say you didn't check the you didn't check the checklist, you know, the um the predetermined things like so how do you how do you reckon with it now? Like what is what has been divine about it for you? Yes, right. The fact that I can sit here right now and right. talk to you about right. this. Um and just even like how things have happened since that time. Um number one, when I went through it, um I wasn't sick or all the things that I thought was going to happen. I didn't miss a beat in terms of what I wanted to accomplish with attending, you know, my kids' activities, going to work, yeah. being present with family. Um, so all of that happened. And I think it just made me more open and aware of receiving information. Mm -hmm. When we are bogged down with just whatever it is we are involved in, we get tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. And that become probably our entire existence. And I can tell you that that is definitely something that um, I was practicing. So for me, why was it divine? How else was the good Lord going to say, if you don't sit your <laughs> butt down and listen? Right. right. I would have never ended up at the VA. Right. I would have never had this um, elder come and see me who talked to me about the message that she had from the end. Like, none of that would have happened. And all of that, I think, was connected and purposeful in getting me to just shift and refocus, um, regroup, and do what it is I am here to do. All right, let me ask, let me ask you this, because I am, I am a, such a believer of things being in divine order. Like, it is a principle that I hold sacred no matter... Like, nobody can really convince me that everything doesn't happen the way it's supposed to be. I believe that wholeheartedly... I have t testimonies to like point to that. I have real life experiences that mm -hmm. you know that that point to that. Um, but I also the argument that I also wrestle with is, all right, how does that work with like extreme traumatic experiences, right? Like when people really experience, yeah, traumatic events. You know, how does that? How do people see see that? Now again. I have my thoughts on that. I still think that there's some divine order in that too. You know, there's something there for us to be able to learn and assess, to be able to, you know, help us go forward, so, so to speak. Right. How do you view that? Absolutely. Very similarly. It's always an opportunity to learn and to grow. And even though it's awful and it's traumatizing, it's intended to move us right. in the direction that we are intended to be on. Mm -hmm. When we're off track, when we're not living in purpose, when we're not working in purpose, when we're not walking in faith in our spiritual selves, the universe, ancestors, higher power have a way of saying, okay, I need you to listen. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't listen. Right. Until we're right. hit with something right. traumatic. Right. The answers be right there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the, an the answers Absolutely. be right there. Yeah. yeah, when we when we are aware enough, more times than not, I remember I heard somebody say one time, you know, life is hard, but it's not that complicated. A lot of times we make it more complicated than it has to be. A lot of times the answers are within our being, within our body, within our community. Mm -hmm. More times than not, it's like right there in front of us. It's That's just right. hard to take the blinders off and, you know, move through what we experienced in the con to, to kind of right. get it. Yeah. Um, and doing a lot of the couples work that you've been doing today, yeah, we know that a lot of people have been going to therapy and, like, reaching out for services and providers and, you know, seeking their own healing from the pandemic. I, I don't have no idea what the analytics and the numbers say, but mm -hmm. they sky high, right? A lot of people have been looking to go and get services. What have you seen, like, you know, on a day-to-day -day with people coming to, you know, to, to get help? Like, what are couples coming to you for? Like, what are they, they're like, yo, that, man, this relationship is way worse than I thought. Like, I need you to fix it all. Is it, like, communication style? Like, you kind of more still, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, what are people coming to you for? Like, what have you seen? Yeah. It's interesting because most couples, I think the safe word or when couples come in, what they almost always, and I'm willing to even say 100% of the time, is communication. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because I say, well, 
Communication is a symptom of something else. <laughs> yeah. It's a symptom of something else. Communication is the byproduct of something else yeah. <laughs> happening between two people. Mm-hmm. And so usually um, I like to focus on, here's the thing, there are five basic psychological needs that we all have. And even in my training and doing trauma work, what I understand is when we're traumatized or something disturbing happens, it really impacts us psychologically in these five basic fundamental needs that we all have as humans. And when those things are rocked, not even having to be rocked by a trauma or a disturbing event, but when we're socialized in a certain way or when we have... um, ideas of relationship that we're idolizing, whether that's in our homes or, you know, whether it's celebrity. Yeah, social media. Mm -hmm. Social media. Mm -hmm. So we we have these different ways of viewing relationships or what relationships should be. Mm -hmm. It does impact these five areas. And so I'm always talking to my couples about, um, okay, so I know it's communication. Every now and again, there's issues with um, infidelity. Um, a lot of it is division of household responsibility, gender roles. Yeah. Um, a lot of finances. It, finances is in there, and a lot of it is really, you know, um, kids. Kids is in there, but is I think the primary is John. It's about how we emasculate our men and how our women stand on the superwoman syndrome. Mm. Like if I can conceptualize exactly what they're talking about when they're talking about it, like the day-to-day experiences and practices, that's what we're talking about. And essentially that again is a symptom of, of slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that also shows up. Mm -hmm. So we have our, our enslavement history and how, Certain things are um, translated down from generation to generation. Those five psychological needs that we all have that gets rocked. Um, trust. And it's just not trust in the sense of, am I faithful? Is my partner cheating on me? But can I trust that my partner is going to make good decisions, mm-hmm. good financial decisions? Can I trust that my partner is going to put the family first? Mm-hmm. Can I trust that my partner is going to keep us safe? So it's not necessarily trust in the sense of infidelity. Mm -hmm. But when we think of trust, which is why we can't come in and say that's my issue, it's limited to cheating cheating. and infidelity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second one is safety and very similar to trust. Like, do you feel safe in your relationship? Again, not necessarily that there's violence, Physical. Mm -hmm. physical violence or aggression or anything like that going on. But do you feel safe that your partner is going to make good decisions? It's going to put the family first, going to put the relationship first, et cetera. Um, Power and control, another issue. Most couples come in and we come into relationships with our own individual experiences, right? And that's our reality. We stand on those principles in relationships, right? right? And we will argue tooth and nail. We're going to die about that. (laughs) Right? It creates a lot of stress mm-hmm. and a lot of conflict in relationships. That's that power and control. So then it's the issue of control and power. Both partners, in a sense, are stubborn or stuck in the way that they learned how to be in relationships. And so that becomes very problematic. Um, the third one is esteem. I mean, fourth is esteem. We come into relationships with our view of self and whether that is a healthy view of self unhealthy, whether it's negative, whether it's challenge, we bring that into relationships. Most women that I work with um, have issues with with body image or if their partners are still physically attracted to them, especially after they've had children and their Mm -hmm. bodies went through um, a lot of transition. My men talk to me about, again, the reality of not feeling um, physically attracted to their partners or when they get into relationships, partners tend to let themselves go or they don't put the same energy and effort into themselves as they was doing before they got into the relationship. That is a, a real thing that my men often talk about. So that kind of dynamic plays out. So esteem is that other um, 
psychological need that that gets rocked or it influences the interactions or the conflicts that couples have. And then finally is intimacy. And so intimacy is not limited to sex, although couples talk a lot about their issues, concerns, and challenges with sex. And not just sex, but demonstrations of affection or, or communication or connectivity, like How are we bonding and strengthening the connection between us if we're not having intimate moments? Mm -hmm. So those things is what I tend to focus on, although my couples come in and almost always say, we're here because communication is terrible. I understand the communication is terrible, but let me see what else is going on. Because I assure you, if we address and we talk about these things, the communication will improve. It's going to be a byproduct of those five things you just named. Though, and and understanding that that historical context right. and history that also plays a role into how we see relationships. So does the emasculation that you talked about, does it show in those things that you just named or is it like something else, I guess? Yeah, so you definitely see it um, in the power and control. <laughs> Again, people. So you got. All right, you got. Break, you got to break it down. I know what you mean when you say the emasculation, but what does yeah. that? What does that look like? I guess you know what I'm saying for people to be able to understand and make sense of it when they hear that. Okay, some emasculation is going on. Or what is that? What is that? How does that look? What does that come off as? Oh yes, our black women, unfortunately, um, speak very negatively about and to. Are black men. Oh, they're going to be mad you said. That's okay. <laughs> but I go ahead, tell them. Why, go ahead. <laughs> I understand why. Yes. But it, and it's a pattern. Because I'll talk about what our brothers are doing <laughs> right, too, right? Right, facts. But. <laughs> right. Oh, she, get, she getting her mic. She, she got a mic over there to talk to chime in. She getting ready, y'all. <laughs> Absolutely. So, my sisters, what we do, and again, this is all a byproduct of our history Um, how we've been socialized in terms of what it means to be black women. Mm -hmm. And because we have been socialized to do it all ourselves, like that's, that's even how society is structured, especially when you see that our black men are not even allowed to be in home with women who are receiving public assistance. When you think about, you know, the rate at which our black men are incarcerated, when you just think about just how we're performing as a people, black women take on a lot. That stems from slavery. Yeah. When the fathers, the men were taken away, and again, what, what happened to them is they were pegged against other women, and they were having sex and, and breeding, right? So then we wonder how our black men are out here, you know, cheating or with this pimp mentality, all of that stems from slavery. Mm -hmm. So let me get back on track. Mm -hmm. So our black women, they talk down, degrading, demeaning black men. You're not worth nothing. You don't make more money than me. You're not contributing. You know, things like that, which is only stinging, not, not stinging and jabbing, but is reinforcing this you know, view of self or the stereotype of the black man that keeps us limited or stuck in this space. It is, it's very dangerous. It happens a lot in almost every black relationship that I have been exposed to. It's elements of it. In some cases, it's more severe, Mm. but you do see elements of it show up, especially when there's conflict. So yes, we speak very negatively, poorly, and down about our black men. Our black men are, you know, thugs, street, uneducated, you know, not grinding, not making enough money. Not good all dads. All of those things. <laughs> not good dads. Yeah. Not present. Mm-hmm. So that's what the world tells us about black right. men, right. which means... Is socialized and embedded in our psyches more than we're willing to bet. Mm -hmm. But when it shows up in our household and there's a conflict or something happens, the gloves come off and it's it's going. Yeah, you fighting. It's it's going. (laughs) So I had one couple, and this is very interesting. I had I had this one couple 
um, and I've seen this happen both ways, but I'm going to talk about a, a situation where um, I had this one couple who the, the woman, her husband, um, they got into a conflict or whatever the case might be. And so she went outside the home and he locked the door behind her. So passive aggressive being funny, you outside, I'm going to lock the door, she outside on the phone. Mm-hmm. Nothing violent or aggressive or anything like that happened, but she called the police mm-hmm. and the police came. And when you think about calling the police on black men, especially when there's no real That's a no no. Danger, That's a no no. That's a cardinal rule. You don't yeah. do that. <laughs> So we had to, we and again so she was we, black too. This is a black couple. Okay. So we have to have a conversation about about that and the impact of right. that or how right. that could have went right. in the direction that right. is not okay. Right. Um, so it's things like that, and when it when it shows up, it shows up. Yeah. And it becomes a focus. So again, for me being the couples therapist that I am. I'm going to focus on that, and I, I want to understand what you was thinking about when that happened. Because I asked, I said, you called the police, did you feel unsafe? Like what? And she was like, no. I said, so you wasn't unsafe, or there was no real threat or anything like that? She was like, no. I just called the police because he locked the door and wouldn't let me in the house. Mm. So we had a conversation. That could, go, that could go so many ways. It could go so many ways. <laughs> right. But again... It also speaks to like respect. Mm-hmm. If we respect each other and ourselves and what it really means to be black men and women living in this country, how we move is going to be very different. Right. right. How we empathize and understand is going to be very different. Right. So all of that, you know. All right, so you got to give me the other side. Give me what you see a lot of the a lot a lot of the fellas. What we what we coming to the table with that you seeing us, you know. The fellas come in, um, understanding. It's got to be control, right? Let me guess. So, let me guess. Let me guess. It's overcompensating. Yes. Is it? Uh, is it control? Okay, you said overcompensation. So the power and control happens. It's overcompensation. I would say a lot of a lot of fellas is probably struggling with more insecurities than they probably want to let on. Um, we also are coming with. Um, Probably a lot of mother, uh, mother issues. Yeah, a lot of lot of lot of mommy issues. Probably that we haven't Absolutely. dealt with. Probably didn't, that didn't know. Um, and I would say the the communication, the safe part. When you talked about the safety piece, mm-hmm. that's what I thought about. Like right, as as men, like I know a big thing for me when I thought about Sears and our communication style being different, and the safety piece for me. Mm-hmm. I tr- I trust her. I knew that I um I knew that I could say things to her and she wouldn't judge me, right? And I knew that there was an element of safety there from that, mm-hmm. right? But the safety piece that I probably was struggling with my own self internally was just feeling confident and comfortable enough to just like bring stuff to the table and just get it get it off me, right? Like that's an element that yeah, just growing up in relationship, previous relationships at home, that's not something that, you know, was was cultivated and like, you know, groomed me to like, you know, feel comfortable about. So I would think that a lot of a lot of us is probably struggling with that as well. Listen, it's huge. And what you're talking about is vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And when people are afraid or limited to be vulnerable with their partners, mm-hmm. that in and of itself creates a lot of problems. And yes, power control issues um, with men. So here, when we come into relationships, so not only are we coming in with whatever the stress is or whatever that issue is that we're like, okay, we probably should go see a couple's therapist for this. There are things that we look for um, that allows us to get underneath what our men and women are experiencing that's showing up in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we understand is that we're all different. We came up differently. We might even have different values and beliefs. We have different parenting styles. We have different ways in terms of how we view money and mm-hmm. how money should be. Like we have, we're different. We might even have different political views. Yeah. These are the things that come up. So we know that there are differences, right? 
So we have to get to a place where we understand what those differences are and not necessarily change them. Accept them. But you have to accept them. Ooh, you have talking. to accept them. Absolutely. <laughs> that was tough. That was tough for me yes. to, to do, you know, because you think you are, you think you love a person and you with this person, you choosing to live your life with this person. So of course I accept this person to be who I am. Right. But when you start to question, judge, and like try to shift the way that a person is going, are you really accepting that person? Exactly. <laughs> change them. And they come in, Dr. Lyon, you need to change. Who right and who wrong? Right. I say it all the time. Nobody is right or wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, almost always, if not 100% of the time, what both people are saying is valid. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's valid. And anytime there's validity in what you're saying in terms of how you experience the relationship, what your thoughts and feelings are, we have to be able to hear that, validate it, and accept. If we are focused on, hyper-focused on what those differences are and changing it so I can be more comfortable. I need you to change so I can be more comfortable in this relationship. But now you uncomfortable because you didn't change outside of who you are. <laughs> you understand? That's a conflict. So the goal is not to change people. Mm-hmm. The goal is to develop empathy where we understand our partners to agree. Like we have a deeper understanding of self, self in connection with our partner, and we have a deeper understanding of our partner that allows us to move in a way that is going to be healthy and productive for the relationship, not one individual focusing in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So tell me again, what what the fellas bring? What what are you seeing us bring, bring, bring to bring the couple's therapy? So all of that. So inability to be vulnerable, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about insecurity. Again, it's not insecurity... Because you think that they're, you know, doing something else or it's connected to infidelity. But when we're not healthy and we have all of these stereotypes that we're trying not to live up to, or when we have internalized racism and oppression that is like compromising us, that stuff shows up in your relationship. And so insecurity. Who's making more money in the house? And if your woman is making more money in the house, are you acting out? Right. What are you doing? Are you able to help? Are you able to contribute? Are you okay with a shift in gender roles? What is your healthy understanding of what it means to be a black man? Like that's the number one fundamental question that black men need to be asked when they enter a relationship. But if they have traditional roles or views based on where the man is the head of the household and make that's not going to work because that's not our setup. Right. Right. But how are you able to compromise? What is your level of flexibility that you can engage and say, yeah, I'm secure enough in my relationship that my woman can have a PhD and she can make six figures or more money than me, but this is how I hold her down. Right. Because at the end of the day, none of that means anything. That's right. <laughs> it's how do you hold each other right. down? Right, right, right. What Let me be clear. Exactly. Sierra makes way more money than me, but I have no problem showing up in every capacity that is needed at home, period, right. point blank, period. That's right. I cook, I clean, I take care of my babies. I, what else do I do? Boo, get on the mic and tell me what else do I do that defies gender rules, gender roles. What else do I do? Come on, give me some credit. I'm asking real quick. Help, help me out. You know, I think you do everything. I guess what I'm, I guess when I hear T talk about that and the impact of slavery, right? Mm-hmm. It just makes me think so much about people not being able to be fully human and the subtleties of how that shows up. Yes, because right. black people have not been able to be them full selves, understand who they are, reconnect to that in so many spaces. So then how would I be able to do that in the most intimate space if I've never experienced it, never seen it? I'm trying to understand who I am, what that means, deconstruct some stuff. Like, that's a lot. And like, it's going to show up the most in relationships. So like, I think that you do all of those things to go back to your original question. But I think that that's because we cultivate a space where we can allow each other to be fully human. That's right. And a lot of it is like being able to say like I'm thinking like this, right? right. And like no, that's, a fact. that's what a lot I think that's the subtlety of it. Because some people might even say, like to go back to the example, I might not talk like that's the thing for me in our relationship. I'm not gonna talk to you crazy, right? So to T's point. But 
I might think things because of how I've been socialized that are still connected to like some white stuff mm -hmm. or oppression or et cetera. But us being able to have a conversation about me have a conversation with myself and have a conversation with you about how those things are showing up in my head space and us talk through those things because it's still going to show up behaviorally in some way, mm -hmm. even if it's not that I'm outright disrespecting you and how we think about disrespect. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like the subtleties of it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's a, that's, that's a fair point, right? Like it's, it's, it's hard for, and this is, this was crazy because when you talk when you talk about all of these variables included all the stuff that we deal with from oppression to really not being healthy to not really being used to having these space to be able to communicate and just show up as ourselves fully human mm -hmm. um looking to provide and take care of these responsibilities of children when i hear all of this stuff that we deal with i'm like man why wouldn't you go get you some help why wouldn't you go talk to somebody about that cuz that's a lot of that is a lot of shit to deal with you know what i'm saying when i hear all of that i'm like why are people not Tapping in and really trying to, you know, go and get help. You know, that's the thing that comes to my it's mind. It's unhealthy. Right. <laughs> we normalize it. We normalize it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. All right. Listen, I gotta ask you some questions okay. that a lot of people ask. Like, it's I got some real, some real, real good questions. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna say a lot of people's names except for the people who told me that I can say their names. All right. Okay. So, all right. So my homegirl Shay, she said, put my name real big. So shout out, <laughs> shout out to Shay. She said. This is her this is her question too. So okay. I'm I'm asking it so she know I'm asking it just how she put it. She said, Shit, how the fuck do I even find a man? Put my name real big. That's what she said. How do I even find find a man? That's the question. Yeah. So <laughs> here's the thing. My question. so I hate to answer a question with a question, but this is one of those times where it's appropriate. Okay. How is she making herself available? Mm. Right? What you mean by that? So, what spaces is she showing up in? Okay. Like, what is she doing to... Like, physical spaces? Like, where is she going? Like, where is she spending her time? Is that what you mean? Partly. Okay. Um, and then also, you know, when you think about spiritual connections and how the universe is always in order and you will bump into the person you are intended to okay, bump Okay, so how into. is she taking care of your, her, herself? Like, What is she doing? That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, it's not necessarily about how do I find a man, when we are focused on finding a, a partner, it's always interrupted or, you know, we find ourselves doing things that's out of line with who we are and what it is we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Usually it naturally happens. Okay. And you just got to be patient, work on self in the meantime, and show up in spaces that's going to create those opportunities. But most women say that and they're isolated. Mm -hmm. They're not really, you know, they're not involved or active or, you know, exploring. Yeah. So the other thing too, and I don't know that I buy into this, but what I will tell you is almost, almost all of my couples have met online. So... I was going to ask you about that. That has to be more normal than today than it has been ever. Listen, I almost all almost all of my couples in their successful relationships too have What's the, met what's the different ages too? A variety of age, age, yes, ages? Yes. Dating apps or social media? Both. Both. But more so the dating apps. Yeah. The dating apps are huge and so even though we probably frowned upon or I don't know about that Listen, people are meeting, and that's probably the primary source of how people are finding partners and getting married, and those relationships are working. So that was also um, revealing. Get on the day and app, Shaya. Get on the day and app. Stop playing. Okay. Get on the day and apps out here. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay. Good Good answer. And remain open. Remain open. Okay. No expectations. What's the right way to date casually? The right way to date casually? casually? Yeah, that's the question. I don't know that I understand the question. Um, give me some more. I don't know. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what she what she said so I can okay. so I can really you know what I'm saying because I don't want to I don't want to mess it up. Hold on, give me one 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 second. See, this is a good thing about when you're on your own shit, you can just like you know <laughs> do a little spin spin real quick. All right, all right, all right, all right. So she says. Of course, when I'm looking to look it up, it's not loading. Okay. It 
See, she didn't even she didn't even say nothing else after I said it. So I'm I'm a guess. I'm gonna go out on a limb and, and guess what I think she means by dating casual. I'm guessing that she's just talking about dating different people at once, maybe, but just trying to figure out how do you figure out who's best for me? Like how do you choose which one is best? How do you communicate that to people that listen, I'm dating multiple people? Maybe not necessarily in a sexual way, but just like I'm I'm seeing different people, you know. Um how do you deal with that as a woman? Because a woman asked me this question. Like, is that, because mm-hmm. that's something, I, I wouldn't know, you know, is that something that women um, are getting used to? You know what I'm saying? Just being open with um, telling the world and just being open about dating different people at once. So I'm guessing that's what it is. Hopefully I, hopefully I mess up your, hopefully I mess up your question too much. <laughs> so that is a common thing. And again, when you think about women and men in general meeting multiple people on social media or on these dating apps, Mm -hmm. they are dating multiple people at once. Okay. Um, And so there's no right or wrong way to do it, but you must be open and and communicate Mm -hmm. um, and don't really have any expectations. So one thing that tends to Mm, happen is the comparison. Yeah. But you're not going to get a perfect person. So it's all about what you're going to be willing to tolerate and what you're not going to be able to tolerate. What are those deal breakers? Right. But you don't want to date with expectations of how you want the person to meet whatever your checklist is. <laughs> right. That right. never goes right. well. Right, right, right. So I don't know that there's a right way to do it. Okay. But you want to be open. You want to be flexible. And you want to communicate Mm. And be open and honest about you know. Well, we're just casually dating. I'm not. We're not committed. And then you also got to give that same grace and respect because the other thing that happens is, well, you know, we're casually dating. We're not committed. But if you find out that someone was on another date or did something with somebody else, right? You, yeah, it's it has to with. go both ways. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, right. So this actually kind of goes in the line of what you just kind of said. Okay. It says, how can you be confident someone is being genuine and will be trustworthy? Yeah. Again, first of all, we always say, well, you got to be open and you got to be transparent. Um, You got to communicate. Right. But the other thing, too, is that sixth sense that we all have. You got to feel the energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That intuition, that discernment. Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. And and for me, I think you will know. Me too. Because that energy is so strong and so powerful. And even when you try to resist it, or you can't really articulate it. It's going to come back. <laughs> it's going to be there. Right. And so that's something else that we have to pay attention to. We don't have to force it. Mm-hmm. We don't have to force anything. If you mm-hmm. attract to somebody and you like somebody, you spend time with them, you will know. Right. And you- now, well, that's what I tried to tell C early on when I was trying to bag her. I'm like, girl, you know you feel this. Why are you playing? You know, uh-huh. you know you feel this, you know, this, this energy between us too. I said that. So I said, you don't feel nothing between us? She said... No, <laughs> <laughs> like you know you lying, <laughs> but no, that's that's good. That's good. I, I like that. All right, let me ask you this one. It says, "How do you help create a safe space where your partner wants to be more affectionate?" Where your partner wants to be more yes. affectionate. So here's the thing: um, we didn't talk about love languages, mm-hmm. but love languages are so important. So when we thinking about increasing affection, even increasing more positive communication and more bonding, focusing on those five love languages is so important. And so understanding what your person's love language is, whether it's physical affection or maybe it's acts of service or quality time or something else. But so my first reaction when you said that, I'm like, well, does her partner want physical affection? Or right. is that something that that right. person wants? Right, right. So that's what made me go to the five love languages. Okay. So understanding, take the five love language quiz. Mm-hmm. Learn about how you want to give and receive. Mm-hmm. And when you know how your partner want to receive, you want to appeal to that. Not what you want, because that's you. Mm-hmm. But what does your partner want? Yeah. So if your partner wants... Um, more affection, again, if that's their love language, it's going to naturally happen. You don't have to do anything with that. Right. But if that's your love language and you want your partner <laughs> to do that, then there's ways to kind of, you know, communicate or express how to make that happen. Okay, good. Yeah. And this next one is a real good one. I said I was interested in hearing your answer to this too okay. because I literally have just learned how to do this within the last couple of years. How do you fight the right way? There is a right way to fight. Right. How do you fight the right way? 
fight in the right way. So I think in order for this to happen, there has to be a level of conscious awareness mm-hmm. um, that you understand that when there's a conflict, it is okay to express. It's healthy. It's normal for you to express your experience of whatever is happening and how you are thinking and feeling about the experience. Right. It's the experience, not the person. Right. When we go at the person is when all this slavery, internalized racism stuff pop right. in and now we jab in. And we jab and we project and we, we trying project, to hurt. We demean right. it, like right. all of that stuff. Right. Unfortunately, it's how we've been socialized. Right. And so if we don't have a level of consciousness where we know that by default, that's the go-to mm-hmm. when conflict is heated, mm-hmm. it's going to happen every time. Yeah. But if we understand that, okay... We, we are having a disagreement. I'm feeling some kind of way. This is a problem. What I want to talk about is what I'm experiencing mm-hmm. and how I'm thinking about and feeling about what I'm experiencing based on whatever has happened or transpired. It keeps it clean. It keeps it focused on the situation. And more times than not, the response is, oh, I didn't know, that's not what I intended. Right. Or I didn't know that, you know, that that would hurt your feelings. So this, this is getting back to an earlier thought I wanted to make, and I must have got off track. We also have sensitivity. So differences is one. But then each of us have what we call sensitivities. And so those are those things that we grew up with. Those are those no-nos that make us go from zero to 100. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so for most people is men is disrespect, right? That's a sensitivity. If I feel disrespected in my home, I'm going from zero to 100. Right. Women, more so than not, is feeling controlled. If I feel like you're trying to control me, <laughs> yeah. I'm going zero to 100. Right. So we all have sensitivities in terms of you know how our mothers may have treated us or how they may have not shown us love or how you know they may have demeaned us like whatever those experiences are we also have sensitivities we need to know that about each other and if we don't know that about each other we're going to always hit those sensitivities right. which is going to create more conflict and a mm-hmm. disconnect we also have to be careful, though, when we do no- learn those sensitivities, you don't want to use those. Use them against them. Yeah. You don't want to use that as ammo. You right. have to stay away from it. If you're in a relationship and you feel in that person and you want to be with the person the rest of your life, you want to learn what those sensitivities are and you want to stay away from them. Right. That's right. it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Here's a here's a good one um, that I know the, a lot of the fellas is trying to you know understand, even myself to an extent. How to balance work life from family life without sliding your family? Because a lot of times, you know, listen, we we hustling, we grinding, you building something, you trying to create something. So we are trying to um, have a certain amount of just to provide. You know, more times than not, it's probably fin- financially. But in order to provide financially, you have to put time in into things. What ultimately means that the closest people close to you gonna sacrifice. So how do you find that balance? Yep. So what I like to tell my people all the time is you have to schedule your time mm. every day. Just how you schedule the grind. And sometimes I think we're not really scheduling. We're just flying off the seat of our pants. So we get up, we grind in, and we're going to grind until we are tired for the day. So things have to be scheduled. And sometimes that sounds re- like it's restricting or it's limiting and... Like, why would I do that? No, that's I tell real. my people all the time. You need to schedule what is a priority. And if your family or if your partner, your wife, your husband is a priority, you better schedule that time. No, that's real. And sometimes, and yeah, sometimes it can look rigid, right? It can, yeah. it can, it can feel rigid. It can mm-hmm. make it look like it's taking away the spontaneity and it's taking away the the fun of it. You know what I'm saying? Like where you feel like sometimes people tell you. Listen, you got to schedule sex. You got to schedule. Listen. You got to schedule. You got to put all these things. You got to schedule an intimate time. You got to schedule date to. night. You have to put those things on the you schedule. Have Sometimes to. people hear that and be like, "Man, I don't want to do that." You know what I'm saying? It's taking away from the fun, but it's We have to grow with the time yes. and we have to grow with the relationship. <laughs> right. That stuff is honeymoon phase. Right. The first year right. or so, y'all, yes, it's going down. Right. But then we get together and, you know, things naturally shift. Mhm. 
And so now we're at a time, and that's, again, having that rigid mindset is why relationships fail. Yeah. You have to be able to get with the times and the status of the relationship. And more long-term committed relationships, the spontaneity is not always going to be there because right. life is happening. Kids, right. work, right. everything is happening. Right. You got to schedule it. And yeah. if you're not willing to schedule that, it's not going to happen because, again, your priority is the hustle and bustle of whatever that grind is. Right. So, yeah, you got to, you, look, I tell my couples all the time, and I had this one couple, I'm like, you got to schedule to have sex. Schedule two or three times, however often y'all want to do it. We have these conversations, and we get very specific. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, that I got to say this, John, because <laughs> this is important. This came up um, with one of my couples recently. Um, I have this one couple that I'm working with, and like they'll say, well, one of their strengths is um, their sex life. Mm hmm but one of their challenges is their closeness and, you know, not necessarily being intimate. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And how are y'all engaging sexually? Because there is a difference. And she, they was like, it's a difference? Yes, it's a difference. And based on those differences... It's going to allow you to, to stay disconnected how y'all are or to be able, able to bond. And so there's four categories. There might be a fifth or a sixth, but there's four categories that we talk about in terms of sexual intimacy. The first one is lovemaking, mm -hmm. right? It's rare that that's what couples are doing. And so then um, the couple's like, well, what do you mean? And so again, there's no right or wrong way. The couple should define for themselves what that okay. entails. But there are certain things that happen when there's love making that doesn't happen when it's just sex, when it's just, excuse my language, fucking. Okay. Yeah, go or ahead. Or when it's yeah. a, a quickie. Uh -huh. Like all of those have different elements. And what couples don't necessarily understand is it does make a difference right. in terms of the health of the relationship. You got to do a variety of all of it. A variety of all of it. But if y'all just Man, yeah, every, that's what y'all gonna feel. The mic picked you up, Dr. T. You that's can still hear That's my own personal <laughs> stuff, right? I'm like, I'm trying to be professional, but yes, but yeah, if that's what's happening, right. that's gonna be the spirit of the relationship, right? Right. But if that's happening, and then every now and again there's some passionate love making, then you get your balance. Every now and again there's a quickie. That, like it has to be a combination of all of those things. But if it's one sided. Even if it's just always love making, well, somebody is gonna get bored with right. that. Do you understand <laughs> right. what I'm saying? So it has to be some diversity right. in how people are engaging sexually. And what I want our people to understand is it makes a difference because when life happens and conflict happens, if y'all gelling in that area, you're gonna recover quicker. And that's what it's all about. We all going to have conflict. We're all going to have differences. We might not always accept what those differences are, but how you recover, how y'all recover from when these things happen, make or break relationships. Okay, you said it's five of them. So is it is love making? I know I said it's four. I said okay, it might four. be a five. Okay, it's, okay, it's four. All right. So what's the four? Love making? Uh-huh. What's the other three? Sex. Sex. Fucking. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> quickie. Oh, quickie. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. That, that's good. So and here's the thing. And and then there, there are similarities, right? And this is what we talk about. So even with um love making and fucking, there's there's a level of passion that happens. Yeah. What makes it different is like the talking and the you know, some of the sex talks yeah. and things like that that might happen. Some of the details. Some of the details. Whereas right. in love making, it's it's less talking, but it's more like you're staring at each other's it's eyes. It's sensual. It's okay. beautiful, right? Yeah. So those two, and I tell couples all the time, they, they're very similar, and it's these little elements right here that makes it different. But then, like, quick and say, it's just dry. It's nothing. Right. You, okay, let's do it, and we're over with. Right. There's no affection. There's no foreplay. There's none of that right. um, that takes place. And those are two are in a different, you know, category if we have to categorize them. Okay. And depending on, and usually some... Usually couples is doing one from each category mm -hmm. for the most part. So, because are you talking about, or is this something different? Like, um... Talking to the Michael. Like, uh... 
one framework is like erotic, like blueprint stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So, erotic blueprint. Like some like like what your primary style is. That's right? right. Okay. And so the importance of knowing what your primary style is, in addition to what you're saying, or are you saying what you're saying is another framework for like what people would call like this erotic blueprint thing? You know no, what I'm saying? I think so. We so very similar to the love languages, yeah. right? We have to know what our, our style primary is and what our partner's uh, style is. Okay. Our primary. There's, okay. a, there's always so a primary. It's important to explore the different Absolutely. areas and functions and what they are, but everybody has a primary. So Absolutely. just like love languages, we have sex a languages. Yes. Like. And that's right. Ah, sex that's languages. Is I'm there a test for this? Is there a quiz for this? I don't test know. Like a love language quiz? Yes, for sex languages? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there is a test for this. There's a lot of tests. And so, um, <laughs> and you know this because you don't know this. Yes, you do. We That's why I got Dr. T on here. I don't know this. <laughs> yes, you do. I can guess what I think mine are, but I don't, I don't, I don't yes, know this to be do. true. You do know. We I mean, I know my here. style, but right. I don't know. I didn't know that this, it was but a test. But that's also assessment. interesting too. So let me say something about that. Mm -hmm. Most people will say, I know what my primary is, whether it's sex language or love language. Okay. But when they take a quiz and they're asked certain questions, it literally shit, and they're surprised. I had one person like, let me take the test again. Well, go ahead. And it still came out to be something different. And the reason that that happens or how I make sense of it is you only know what you know. Mm, true. Right? True. <laughs> you don't know. True. Especially if you haven't had any experience or exposure to the alternative. And so, yeah, sometimes taking those quizzes where there are certain questions that what's will... This, what's you. this website and called? I'm about to fix this to quiz. All of them. And you because, want to explore. Yeah, because That's also there are no reasons that. that you're within one that maybe in different seasons you're in some other... Right. Like have some other primary... Right. But yeah, there's different frameworks. So that's a that's a that's a good point. That brings me to the next question. I'm gonna I'm gonna hurry up with these questions because I know you gotta go soon too, Dr. T. Okay. But this one says it says how to move gracefully and respectfully through relationships, seasonal changes. And what I think that they're talking about is the stuff that we're talking about, where you know life happens. No, nothing in relationships stays the uh, stays the same. Whether that's kids, whether that's careers, whether that's global pandemics, whether that's you know. Um, grief, something, something happens, you know, when just life circumstances happen, everything is changing. Right. So, like, how do you move and accept, you know, your circumstances and your partner during, during those situations? So, with something that is very important that all couples must have are relationship rituals. Mm. And just how we have our individual rituals to kind of keep us grounded yeah, yeah, yeah. when life is happening every day, again, the same thing. It's the same concept. The relationship is the priority. So you want to have those relationship rituals, whatever it is. And when you find that things are not happening as you want them to happen or things are feeling disconnected, then getting back to that earlier point of making sure things are being scheduled. Even if it's just time to just talk for 15 minutes but I like to tell my couples find you a ritual whether it's how y'all start y'all day sometimes you can start your day together when y'all come back so if y'all both away from home or one person is away from home how y'all come back together it's very important or how y'all go to bed together ideally if you can hit all three of those that's right. beautiful but that's unrealistic right. so whatever works for the relationship do y'all go down at the same time? And if not, can y'all or what can y'all do before then? Do you, If y'all get up at the same time in the morning, whatever the case, whatever y'all situation is, you got to have daily rituals for the relationship. Yeah, yeah. And it, making sure that how y'all begin, end, and come back together, those three things are super important. It's not going to be perfect every day, but the more you can be intentional about hitting those points, and it just... It builds a stronger connection which allows these changes and adjustments to happen more gracefully. Yeah. But you got to put that work in. Yeah, that's good. All right, last last question. Okay. Um and this is good back coming off of the coming off of the sex talk. It says how to build meaningful and intimate re, intimate uh and connection be or excuse me, how to build meaningful intimacy and connection beyond the physical. Yeah. So again, um the number one indicator for that is being vulnerable with your partner. And that's what that, that's how 
that's what strengthens relationships and connections. Anytime you can go to your partner and you can just say unfiltered, uncut, raw emotions, whatever it is you're thinking, feeling, and experience, and your partner receive that right. and take care of that, you're going to fall in love. Right. right. And you're going to stay in love. <laughs> yeah. And so it's that. It's those opportunities. And it's not just, well, yeah, we, we talk every day. No, what are you talking about? Right. Can you can your partner express to you everything that's going on in their head that's creating stress and anxiety? Right. And when they give that to you, can you take care of it in a way to make them feel safe and to build that trust? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's what we're talking about. It's the meaningful stuff that really shifts who we are as people. That changes the direction of a relationship. If we are not having opportunities or creating spaces to talk about that, it's not going to happen. You can go on as many trips or hang out or dates and this, that, and the other. But if y'all not yeah, talking right. about the meaningful stuff that makes a difference for who you are as an individual in a relationship, that intimacy is always going to be a problem. Right. Yep. And this is the stuff that people can learn when you go get a damn couple therapy. Absolutely. You, you got to. It's important to invest in yourself in these ways. We always talk about business. We talk about financial ways to invest in yourself. But nothing, 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 nothing is more important than investing in yourself and in your relationships, your closest relationships. You know, that's where you spend the majority of your time. That's where a lot of your energy, um, and you know, just that's the thing that is going to... Um, you you're pouring a lot of yourself into, you know, so you're gonna you're gonna get that back two two and tenfold, you know, depending on how you're pouring into it. So mm -hmm. um yes, thank you, Dr. T, for coming on. I appreciate you for sharing all these gems with us. Um we gotta ha we gonna have you back, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. send right. me back. That we gotta do we gotta <laughs> do this. If there's follow up questions. Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. I, I I got you. Well listen, tell people like how they can how they, um, I don't know if you um, accepting clients and stuff like that, but how can people find you? How can they reach out to you and, you know, get connected to you and stuff like that? Absolutely. So um, I am taking new couples. Y'all um, heard her say that. So don't be asking me, to, you know, to connect. The, listen, listen to her. She told y'all. Yes, I am taking new couples. Um, my office, Kindred Spirit Behavioral Health, you can email me at Kindred spirit at dr tania lodge at kindred spirit bh.org my number is 330-271-6160 um the website is is in development so that should be up probably in the next 30 days or so but it again that will be www.kindredspiritbh.org Cool, perfect, and I put all that info like in the um the YouTube link and in the audio link, so people can you know they can they can have that um and, and reach and reach out to you. Um, any any lasting thoughts you want you want to say, ladies? See you over there. Shout out to C over there in the corner, the sleeping baby on, on her lap. Uh, anything y'all want to leave? Last thoughts. It's a shift. I just want to reiterate your comment about investing in yourself and investing in your relationships. Most people believe that they have to work on self first before they get into a relationship, but you learn the most about yourself when you are in relationship. <laughs> yeah. So you don't have to do one before the other. Mm. They both can coexist and happen at the same time. So yes, investing in yourself, investing in your relationships, super important. Um, it feeds you in a way that's very different when you are on a, a journey or quest by yourself. So I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate the conversation. And I'm always open um, to questions, comments, feedback, and coming back for more. So thank you so much, John. No problem. Thank you so much. Listen, another episode, LYP, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>